All right, so today we are now in our fourth lesson. And this becomes uh, the heart of the lesson, guys. This is the heart of the whole course. I know last lesson was a bit heavy, but I pray that you get what we are going to be discussing in today's lesson. So we've seen the emphasis that Jesus has become the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. That was the very last verse of Hebrews chapter 6. Now, into chapter 7, by now someone should be asking to say, who is this Melchizedek? What does it mean for Jesus to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Levi and Aaron? And I know some of you have even uh, been asking that question. So, in your notes, on page number 12 now, I believe, uh, Today, now we are going to be looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 7. And now in Hebrews chapter 7, one of the characters that now comes on the scene is Abraham. Now remember to the Jews who Abraham was. Abraham was the father of the Jews. If you read in John chapter 8, Jesus is a conversation with some Jews. And he is, as he is talking to them, they say we are children of Abraham, we are not slaves, and all those things. And along the line, Jesus, then Jesus says, well, Abraham rejoice when he saw my day. And they said, what? You are not even 50 years old. How can you say Abraham saw you? But then Jesus says, well, before Abraham, I am. In other words, I've always been there. I was there even before this Abraham you're talking about. And Abraham was the father of the Jews. That's where the Jewish nation starts. We've seen how Jesus is greater than angels. We've seen how Jesus is greater than Moses. Now we are attacking Abraham. And he says, Abraham is a small boy compared to me. And you'll see it even in today's lesson. Now, there's a paragraph there which says, Today we shall delve more into Jesus as the high priest in the order of Melchizedek to see what it means. Now, an interesting thing there is that the word priest is mentioned 34 times in Hebrews. And of those 34 times in Hebrews, 15 times it's mentioned in this chapter 7. So you see that chapter 7 is the heart of explaining how Jesus has become a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, uh, there's a space there in your notes where you can write something that you know about, Mel about Melchizedek. I normally ask the students to write something they know about Melchizedek before we start studying and looking into the story. But I'll quickly go ahead with the, with the lesson because there's so much to cover. Hebrews chapter 7 verse number 1, reading from the New Living Translation says, This Melchizedek was a king of the city of Salem and also a priest of God Most High. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. So the main thing that we get about Melchizedek is that he met Abraham and he blessed Abraham. There's a lot of the other things that happened there, but the main important thing, as we'll see even here in Hebrews 7, is that Melchizedek had the audacity to bless Abraham. That's the main point, amen? So now, let's quickly go and read this story of Melchizedek. It's just four, four verses. So if you can quickly turn to Genesis chapter 14, and we'll read about this Melchizedek. So what had happened there is that Lot, who was Abraham's cousin, or nephew rather, had been captured by these, um, by these kings who had attacked Sodom. And um, Abraham determined to go and what? Rescue his nephew, his, yeah, his nephew. And when he went, he went and fought five kings with his own, only his household, and he prevailed, and he rescued what? Lot. So, it says in verse number 17 of Genesis 14, after Abraham returned from his victory over Kedol and Meh, and all his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shave. That is the, uh, the king's valley. So remember, Lot was living in what? In Sodom. So when the Sodom was attacked, even this king, he was attacked by these five kings. So when Abraham went and defeated these kings, in a way he rescued Lot and he freed the king of Sodom and all these people. So the king of Sodom now comes to Abraham and is trying to say, can you give me my people? You can keep the goods, but give me my people. So what then happened? Verse number 18. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and the priest of God, Mosai, brought Abraham some bread and wine. So the first thing we see, Melchizedek brought bread and wine to Abraham. Verse 19. Melchizedek blessed Abraham with this blessing. 
And that's the main thing that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Blessed be Abraham the most God by God the most high. Sorry, blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then after this blessing, then Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. Then the king of Sodom comes there and he talks. But the issue of Melchizedek is done. It's finished. That's it. Only those four verses from verse 17 to verse 20. That's all we know about Melchizedek. The next time he appears, it's in Psalm 110. Where it's talking of Jesus that you've been ordained a priest in the order of Melchizedek. But this is the only information we know about Melchizedek. We don't know where he was coming from. We don't know where, we go, where he went after this. So now in Hebrews chapter 7. You want to go back and continue reading. So, verse number one said, he met Abraham and he blessed him. Verse number two, then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in the battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice and king of Salem means king of peace. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the son of God. So because we are not told where he was born and we are not told where he died, it's like he lives on. Just like Jesus continues to live and he's got no end. That's what he's saying. He then says, consider then how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great, great patriarch of Israel, recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. So he's saying, because Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth, a tithe, he was honoring Melchizedek. Meaning Melchizedek was what? Was great. But what we want to see is who is greater, Melchizedek or Abraham. And remember, Melchizedek represents Jesus. Verse number five. Now, the law of Moses required that the priests who are descendants of Levi must collect a tithe from the rest of the people of Israel who are also descendants of Abraham. Now, this is probably the only time you hear the issue of the tithe in the New Testament. Again, when I say New Testament, I mean from Acts to the end of the Bible. And here it's referring the tithe under the law of Moses. And he says the tithe was brought by other Israelites. Not any person, an Israelite was supposed to give to the Levites, to this one tribe out of the 12 tribes. So the other 11 tribes would give to the Levites because they were not going to work and they did not have any fields and stuff like that. Verse number six. But Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tithe from Abraham. And Melchizedek blessed a blessing, placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. So this is just a narration of what we read in Genesis 14. The application of the main point is not even about tithes. The main point is verse number seven. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. So who is greater? Melchizedek or Abraham? Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek is the one who had the audacity to bless Abraham. And that is the point. And remember, Jesus has now been made a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And now he's going to compare the priesthoods. The priesthood of Aaron and the priesthood of Melchizedek. Amen? Verse number eight. The priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they. Because we are told he lives on. That's number one, because he continues to live. Number two, in addition, we might even say that these Levites, the ones who collect the tithe, paid a tithe to Melchizedek when their ancestor Abraham paid a tithe to them. So we are now saying when Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek, it was like Aaron and the rest of the priests also gave a tithe to this greater priesthood. Meaning the priesthood of Melchizedek is greater than the priesthood of what? Of Aaron. Verse number 10. Uh, verse number 10 uh -huh. For although Levi was not yet born, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected a tithe from him. So hopefully you've caught that. There are two different priesthoods being compared here. The one that we saw from Numbers 3, that Aaron and his sons and his descendants are only priests. And we saw it from Leviticus 16, that it was a permanent 
law, that these are the only ones who could be priests. And under them, they only represented the Israelites before God. Jews were cut out. That's why in Ephesians 2, he says, we were not a people. We were cut off away from the uh, commonwealth of Israel. We had no covenants with God. But now, because of this new priesthood of Melchizedek, who was not a Jew, and that's how Jesus has become a high priest, he now represents anyone who comes to him. And this priesthood is greater than this other priesthood. Man, now he's going to butcher the old covenant. Hold on to your seats if you like the old covenant. Because you are going to be upset. Remember, he's telling Jews who are custodians of the old covenant, these things. Verse 11. So if the priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, now he's brought in the law of Moses. It was part of the old covenant of the priesthood, right? Because Moses is the one who gave us the law of the priesthood, that is only Aaron and his descendants. He says, so if the priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood with a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of Levi and Aaron? Why did God call Jesus a priest in Psalms 110 in the order of Melchizedek? Why didn't he say you are a priest in the order of Aaron? That's the question. And the answer is there that if the priesthood of Levi on which the law is based could have achieved perfection. So it means it could not achieve perfection. It means if you are trying to relate to God basing on the old covenant, it's not going to achieve perfection. Verse number 12, this is key. It says, if the priesthood changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. Now, what he's saying is that the priesthood changed, we are sure, we see from Psalms 110 that God ordained Jesus is a priest in another order. So the priest would change from the order of Levi to the order of Melchizedek. But he says if the priest would change, the law must also change in order to permit the change in the priesthood. This is very important. That last, those two last words, last two words in the New Living Translation say to permit it. I mean, last three words, to permit it. So the law of Moses needs to change in order to allow the change in the priesthood that we've been told about. Now, what does this mean? We are saying, according to the law of Moses, under which we had the Levitical priesthood, this is this side, right? Only Aaron and his descendants could be priests, right? And one of them would be high priest. That is what the law said. And anyone who is an outsider could not become a priest. And now we are saying, if Jesus, who is not of the tribe of Levi, said, I am the new high priest, or I am a priest, he was supposed to be stoned. So these two are not compatible. The law of Moses disqualifies Jesus from becoming a priest. So you need to make a decision. Either we are the, with the law of Moses and you've got a descendant of Aaron as your high priest, or you are going to take Jesus as your high priest, meaning your savior, and you have to come up with a new law, but the law of Moses cannot stand. Because the law of Moses will say Jesus cannot be a high priest. We only want descendants of Aaron as high priests. This is how serious it is. And remember, he's telling the Jews these things to say the law of Moses needs to change. It needs to go away because it disqualifies Jesus. Let me read verse number 13 and 14 for you. It says, For the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members have never served at the altar as priests. What I mean is our Lord came from the tribe of Judah and Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. You see? So according to Moses' law, anyone who comes from Judah cannot be a priest. But since our high priest came from Judah, and God was clever, he had to make it intentional that Jesus should not come from, the, from, from Levi. If he came from Levi, he would have been a high priest in the order of Levi. But no, he had to come from a different tribe so that he can be established as a, as a high priest in a different order, not according to this system, not according to this law. So this law of Moses, together with its priesthood, should go away. So that we can accept this new priesthood with a new law. You know, when you read Hebrews, so, it's so clear. I've talked to a number of people who want to advocate for the law and say, no, the law is eternal, the moral law is eternal. They will come with uh, reasonings like, so are we saying now we can go and murder and commit adultery? No. You shall see it even in this Hebrews. And in basically all of Paul's letters, he always gives us how to live as Christians. And we don't kill people, we don't commit adultery. In fact, if you read it carefully, 
the standards that are set in the New Testament are even higher. Colossians and Ephesians are very clear, they are exhaustive. If you read Colossians chapter 3 and chapter 4 or Ephesians chapter 4, 5, 6, they tell you how to live. It even goes into how husbands should love their wives, how wives should submit unto their husbands and things, how children should obey their parents and all those things. That's Christian guidance. But among those words, it says, according to Moses, it was, do not kill, thou shalt not murder. But according to the New Testament in Colossians, Ephesians, and some of these books, it says, don't even entertain anger. So it's even a higher standard. Under Moses' law, you could be angry as long as you don't kill the person. But they were saying, don't even get angry at people. So we are not saying we now made and commit adultery. In the New Covenant, it says no sexual immorality. We are not just talking about the act of adultery. So we are not saying in the New Covenant we just live willy-nilly. We even have even steeper conditions of how to live. But they are not burdensome because God has changed our nature and this is how we want to live. But honestly speaking, the law of Moses needs to go. Because the first and foremost challenge with the law of Moses, it disqualifies Jesus. And if it disqualifies your high priest, you've got no savior. That's what it means. You've got no one who represents you before God. That's why Hebrews chapter 7 verse 12 says, if the priest would change, the law must also change. Now he's going to tell us how useless this law was. This law of Moses. Where you need to keep the Sabbath and do all these things under the old covenant. Verse number 15. It says, this change, that's the change in the priesthood, has been made very clear since a different priest who is like Melchizedek has appeared. Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirements of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. Verse 17, and the psalmist mentioned this out when he prophesied, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So we are saying Jesus is a priest forever because he does not die. Amen? And he's saying, because of this, we can see clearly, because of Psalms 110, verse 4, that the priest would change it, please. They, no, one does, no one even argues that the priest would change it. But the challenge is people have not accepted that the law is to change as well. Now, he goes on to verse number 18. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. My Lord, telling the Jews that that thing was weak and it was useless. And they're saying, the temple, what are you saying? The temple of God and all these sacrifices that we've been doing, I think it's useless and it's weak. The New King James says, verse number 18, for on one hand, there is an annulling, right, of the former commandment because it was weak and because, also because of its weakness and unprofitableness. So there's an annulling, meaning a repealing, meaning an, an abolishing of the law. We shall see it. Some people will say, ah, you saying Jesus came to abolish the law. Yes, he did that. We shall see it from the word of God. Verse number 19, for the law never made anything perfect, but now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. It has come back again, that application of Hebrews, that we need to draw near to God and we come boldly. Amen? That's the application of Hebrews. But the reason he's saying is because the law made, never made anything perfect. So if you are trying to approach God through what happened in the law, it's useless. It's weak. It doesn't make anything perfect. It won't work. If you say, well, because in the Old Testament, they would bring a first fruit, then God will bless their whole harvest for that year. So God, I'm bringing this first fruit so that you bless my rest of my year or my harvest. It's weak. It's useless. It does not work. There is a new way of approaching God that Jesus gave us. We don't relate to God based on the Old Testament. That's why I am very, very careful to say people when you preach from the old testament be careful what you are saying if you go there and take israel's practice and you try to load it on christians you are making error but there's a right way to preach from the old testament especially if you are grounded in the word of righteousness if you understand these things that we're talking about especially if you understand hebrews because hebrews explains the scriptures it explains the old covenant the old testament amen well let's see some things in your notes here 
before we go further. On page number 13, we talked about Jesus and his priesthood. So, on Roman numeral number 9, it says the change, the change in the priesthood and its effects. We read verse 11 to 14. The point there under A, point number one says, the Levitical priesthood and the law of Moses did not bring perfection. Amen? They did not bring perfection. Keeping the Sabbath will not bring perfection. Those things were pointing to Jesus. Second point, why did God prophesy a new priesthood in Psalms 110 verse number four to Jesus after the Levitical priesthood and the law was in place? It's because he wanted to replace it. He was replacing the old priesthood as well as the law of Moses when he brought in this new priesthood. Third point says, Jesus, according to the law, could not be a priest or even save God. Only Levites could save God. Imagine, according to the law of Moses, Jesus could not even save God as a Levite. To go and even just collect the animals and collect the rubbish, he could not do that. So God had to change the whole system. A complete overhaul. Verse number, point B says, from verse 12, if the priest would change, then so did the law. So the law changed, right? Psalms 110 becomes key for Christians. It meant the change of the law. Because there was a new priesthood in, he introduced, the law also changed. Amen? First point says, you cannot be a Christian with Jesus as your savior, that means high priest, and also observe the old covenant. They are not compatible. You know, Paul was so bold in Galatians chapter 5, from verse 1 to verse 4, he says, I tell you right now, if you are going to be circumcised, which is again a requirement in the Old Testament, it means Christ will benefit you nothing. And in case some people said, what? He says, I will repeat it again. If you are circumcised, you are cut off from Christ. You cannot be saying, I am keeping the Sabbath, but at the same time, Jesus is my Savior. It doesn't work. These two are incompatible. Circumcision was the big thing during Paul's time. Today we've got other things that have risen up. First, second point, if you follow the law and its requirements, Jesus cannot be a priest at all, and let alone your high priest. And remember the reason of the high priest, the duty of the high priest was to present gifts and sacrifice for your sins. It means if Jesus can't be your high priest, it means Jesus did not present you before God. He did not present his blood on your behalf. That's what he's saying. And he's telling Jews who are tempted to go back to the law, now, for you and us Gentiles, with this kind of language, we should not even be thinking about going to the law. It's just like what I was saying about the cyclone in, in Chimani Mani. We are saying Chimani Mani, where there, was, where there was the cyclone, that is the old covenant. And the people living in Chimani Mani are the Jews. And the government is evacuating people. God is evacuating people from the old covenant, saying this thing was useless. Yet we've got Christians living in Zimbabwe, in Harare, wanting to relocate and live in the old covenant in Chimani Man, where people are being evacuated from. So if he's telling the Jews to leave the old covenant, the old covenant should not even, any, should not even be an issue to Christians. We were never under it. The third point says on page number 13 there, you need to make a decision either to be in the new covenant with Jesus, with Jesus as your high priest like Melchizedek or quit Jesus and follow Moses' old covenant and the Levitical priesthood he brought you. On page 14, remember tithes were collected by Levites under the Levitical priesthood. And in the New Testament, people are encouraged to give where they are taught or to assist fellow believers. So the first and foremost you see reason why we give is to assist fellow believers. And the second thing is to support the work of God. Amen? Not to give in order to be blessed or in to give so that God can rebuke the devourer according to Malachi. That was for the Israelites. Amen? You know, sometimes people say we are teaching tithes in the New Testament, but they are quoting from Malachi. People know Malachi 3. It means they are quoting from the old covenant. We are not there. Amen? In the New Testament, we are taught to give. Just call it giving. Amen? If you want to give 10%, give 10%, but just call it giving. Amen? Or you can give whatever you want to give. It's called giving in the new covenant. The next point says you can't talk about circumcision, Sabbath, food, and all those things. <coughs> Leviticus 11 talks about the foods, the meats that should be eaten and meat that should not be eaten. We've got Christians today who say, or, or suppose the Christian who say we don't eat <coughs> the rabbit, we don't eat uh, the catfish, we don't eat 
Pogo because it's written in Leviticus 11. Yet if you read carefully Leviticus 11 verse number 1, it says, The Lord commanded Moses to say, Say to the children of Israel, not to the Christians. Very simple. It was all performance based under the Old Testament. And it meant something. Amen? But that's not so in the New Covenant. All right. Uh, point C. We read Romans, uh, we read verses number 15 to 17, right? And it says, emphasis is made on God establishing Jesus as the high priest, as the priest forever. And that is possible because he does not die. And in a way, doing away with the law and its requirements. Why? Because he broke them. By becoming high priest, he broke the law of Moses. So that thing is out of date. So anyway, now let's look at a few verses to show you again that the law is not in effect today. All right. And guess what? Here there's a statement which says, this is the strong meat that many don't know. And they still hold to the law. Remember, he said, we want to talk about solid food, talking about what it means for Jesus to become in the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. That means Jesus being a priest in a different order. And now he's revealed that if the priest would change, then it means the law also changed. This is strong meat. Now, Galatians 3. Let's look at Galatians 3. Verse number 19 to 29. Hey. Whoa. There's a lot there. But in Galatians 3, he's telling them about the promise, right? And the challenge is that God gave the promise to people before the law of Moses. Then the law came 430 years later. Now, does it mean that it nullifies the promise? Does it mean that if people fail to keep the law, they fail to receive the promise? That's the question. It seems like now the law is negating what God wanted to give people through the promise. So the question, the million dollar question comes in. Why then did God give the law? So Galatians 3.19 from NLT. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. That was the reason for the law. Not to be kept, but to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. So here it even tells you that the law had an expiry date. It was supposed to be in effect only until the child showed up, and that child is Jesus. So yes, the law was ordained, but it was supposed to end the moment Jesus came. By the time this letter to the Hebrews is, is being written, the law should have been gone by now. It says God gave the law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Now a mediator helps two people. Verse number 21, is there conflict between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But we can't, right? The law can't give us life. Verse 22, but the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. He is saying if you truly understand the purpose of the law, you actually see that they work hand in hand with the promise. The promise was ordained, and he said earlier there, the promise was to Abraham and his seed. And his seed is Jesus Christ. So the promise is only to Abraham and Jesus. And for you to, be benefit, to benefit from this promise, you have to be under Jesus. That's what he's saying. But how do you come to Jesus? The law. The law will show you that you are sinful and you need a savior. You need a high priest. So in other words, the law will make you run to Jesus and you receive that promise faster. If the law was not there, some of you would think, ah, but I think I can do it on my own. So the law was given to show you that you can't do it. Quickly run to Jesus so that you can receive the promise. So they work hand in hand. But the challenge is people have tried to keep the law. And the more you try to keep it, the worse. You can't keep it. Verse number 23. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it in another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. Now, verse number 25, now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law is our guardian. As long as the sun comes, we no longer need the law. Amen? 
Let me read it for you in the New King James. There's something that comes out there. The New King James, um, in verse number, let's see. All right, yeah. Verse number 25. I think verse 24 and 25 says, Before, I said, therefore, the law was our tutor. Or some versions will say our schoolmaster. To bring us to Christ. So can you see the law should bring you to Christ. That we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. It's like a taxi. If you hire a taxi from here and you say you want to take you home. When the taxi takes you home, the law is like the taxi. And home is Christ. When the taxi gets, takes you home, what does it do? Does he park there? He then leaves and goes and goes and collects other people and brings them home. Something like that. That's what the law is. So you can now even embrace and understand the, 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 the reason why God gave the law. So that people can be brought to Christ. Amen? Now, let's quickly finish this one and move forward. Verse 26. All right. Verse 26 just concludes that, Lord, now what? We are, no, our, and we are no all children under Abraham. Amen? Now, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Oh, my Lord. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, these are letters written to Christians, right? And remember, these are some of... Remember, this Jesus, Jesus is the author of the epistles. Remember, we saw that. So these are some of the things that Jesus wanted to tell the disciples, but he says you cannot bear it now. However, I will let you know in time to come. Ephesians 2, verse number 14 to 16. Let me read from the New King James Version. It says, For he himself, talking of Jesus, is our peace, who made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. What he's saying is that, before Jesus came, there were two races in God's eyes. There were the Jews and there were Gentiles. Jews, descendants of Abraham, through Isaac and through Jacob. And anyone who's outside there is a Gentile. And Jesus is now the peace who has brought us together. Both Jews and Gentiles. Verse number 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. That enmity that separated us. That wall of separation, right? There was a wall that separated Jews from Gentiles. And Jesus abolished that enmity, that wall. That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Ephesians 2.15 clearly says Jesus abolished the law. Because the law, law, the law is what separated Jews from Gentiles. So as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. I'm reading these verses to solidify Hebrews 7, 12, which says, if there was a change in the priesthood, then also there was a change in the law to permit it. And now I am showing you how Jesus is to abolish the law and change the law. These things, you won't find them there, especially in the Gospels and before. But in the epistles, this thing is so clear. People who argue about these things, they've never really taken time to study the epistles. They will be quoting Matthew 5, but we'll look at Matthew 5 in a, in a minute. So anyway, let me quickly complete this. Verse number 16 then says, and, he might, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting death to the enemy, putting, death, putting to death the enemy. So Jesus abolished the law. Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2. It says from verse 11 to 15, but hey, let me just read where it talks about the law. Verse number 13 says, And you, being dead in your trespass and uncircumcision of your flesh, that means us Gentiles before we were born again, he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Verse 14, Having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, so there was a list of requirements that was against us. Jesus wiped them away, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to his cross, on having nailed it to the cross. So Jesus took that handwriting of ordinances, which are against us, and he nailed them on his cross. You know, when we watch those movies where Jesus died uh, around Easter, 
we see Jesus being nailed on the cross. But in the spirit, Jesus was actually nailing the Ten Commandments. He was nailing the law of Moses to the cross. And he was leaving it there. He was the one having victory on the cross, not, not losing. Verse number 15. Because he nailed the law on the cross, what did he do? Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. You know, the weapon that the devil had, and uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56 confirms this, or 58, somewhere there, I think 56, says that the strength of the law, uh, the strength of sin is the law. The law is the strength of sin. So the law amplified sin. And sin was beating us. So Jesus came and took the law, because that was the weapon that the devil was using, and he nailed it to the cross, and in a way he disarmed principalities by taking the law out of the way. So he took the, way, the law out of the way. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Remember, the epistles are an explanation. Some of, I've heard some people would then say, well, they are ceremonial and moral laws. The ceremonial laws have passed, but the moral laws still stand. Now let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm, I'm glad God put it in so many ways, in so many different ways in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 3, we'll read from verse number 7. It says, but if the ministry of death, come on, listen to this. The ministry of death, written and engraved on stones. What was written and engraved on stones? The Ten Commandments. The moral law, okay, for those who want to separate, though there's no separation in the Bible, there's nothing like that. But the Ten Commandments are being called the ministration of what? Of death. It was says, I'll read it again, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. This law was also passing away. Verse number 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit become not be more glorious? So the ministry of the Spirit is the new covenant. It's being compared to the old covenant under the law. And he's saying the new covenant, the ministry of the Spirit is more glorious. Why? Verse number 9, for if the ministry of condemnation, the law was condemnation, he had glory. The ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. In the New Covenant, people are given righteousness. They are not condemned by the law. Verse number 10. For even what was made glorious, that is the Old Covenant, right? The law, we've seen it, that was engraved in stone. It says, for even what was made glorious, he had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. Right? Because the New Covenant is good. Glory that excels. So if we compare with this one, it seems like this one didn't even have any glory. Now, verse 11 is key. For if what was passing away, the old covenant, the law, which was passing away, was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So the law is passed away. And the covenant of grace is here to remain. The old Levitical priests have passed away. And now this new priest who has come is here to stay. And he has brought in his new law, which does not disqualify him from office. All right. Now, some people will then ask about Matthew 5. Let's go and look at Matthew 5. You will see that what Jesus said was accurate. It's only that people did not see what you are saying. And it's not even a doctrinal thing. It's just a grammar. Grammar that we need to correct. So, Matthew 5, verse 17. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Right? So his aim is not just to take them away, to destroy them, but to fulfill. Now, verse number 18 is the key verse. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one T2 will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now that last part to say till all is fulfilled is the key. So it says nothing will pass away from the law until even it pass away. But it says nothing will pass away from the law until all is fulfilled. That word till is until. Let me read from the NLT before fully explaining this. Verse number 18 
from the New Living Translation of Matthew 5 says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of, the, of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved, until all is fulfilled. That's when it will pass away, when it is fulfilled. Now, in John chapter 20, ah, it's chapter 19, I think, when Jesus was on the cross, he clearly said it. Let me see where he said it. John 19, verse 30. He said it while he was on the cross. And he said, it is finished. It is fulfilled. So the moment Jesus fulfilled the law, when he was on the cross, it could now be abolished. Remember, he says, nothing will pass away from the law until it is fulfilled. Now, let me bring it home. It's almost if I say, I will not go to my office until I finish teaching this lesson. Does it mean I will never go to my office? No. The word until just means I will go to the office, but I won't go before I finish teaching. So that's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18, that nothing will pass away until it's fulfilled. So now that it is fulfilled, it can pass away. And we have already seen from Ephesians, Colossians, Corinthians that it was, it was abolished. Galatians say the same thing. It was only supposed to last until Jesus came. So now that it has come and has fulfilled it, it passes away. And Hebrews is showing us that for him to be a high priest, he has to also make the law pass away. The law has to change. All of these things are saying the same thing. But what I love about this, it gives us a chronological order of things. So in your notes on page 14, on C, point number 3, says, if Jesus didn't abolish the law, then he can't be the high priest. So he had to abolish the law of Moses, which disqualified him from being high priest before he became high priest. Now, let's see how he first abolished the law, then he became high priest. Now, Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, there's something interesting there. I'll quickly read verse number 1. Very early in the morning, the leading priest and the other and the elders of the people met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. Now the leading priests are the chief priests, meaning the high priest is there. And these other priests, those are the leading priests, the chief priests and other priests. Verse number two. Then they bound him and led him away and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Verse three. When Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. Right? Judas sold out Jesus. And they seen, uh uh, Jesus is not going to uh, he's not going to break loose from these guys. Now he's even condemned to die. Then Jesus uh, Judas was regretting what he did. I believe Judas would have uh, had the same mentality that Clopas that we see in Luke 24 had. That they thought Jesus was this powerful Messiah who was going to take over and overcome the Romans and set the Israelites free. But when he saw that, ah, uh ah, -uh, Jesus is going to die, he repented or he regretted what he did. So what did he do? So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests. That means to the high priests and the, other, and the elders. Verse number four. He said, I have sinned, for I have betrayed an innocent man. Now, before we continue, think about this. This is a sinner. He confessed that I have sinned, right? And he's got even money, he's got an offering. And he goes to the high priest and says, look, I have sinned. And he's offering him the offering. I've betrayed innocent blood. What is the high priest supposed to do? Yes, the high priest is supposed to accept. Remember, the high priest, his duties is to represent people before God. He's supposed to offer these gifts and sacrifices for sin before God. And also he's supposed to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward people. Meaning a high priest is supposed to accept and sympathize with what? With Judas. Just like a policeman. If I see a thief and I say, Mr. Officer, this one is stolen my phone. The officer is supposed to help me out. So the high priest is supposed to help Judas here. But look at how he responded. What do we care? They retorted. They retorted that is your problem. This is like the officer. You tell officer, look, this, thief, this guy has stolen my things. And the officer says, uh-uh. He says, what do I care? That's your own problem. 
For me, if an officer does that, he might as well just hand in his badge and ID. He has resigned from being an officer. And I believe this is the time that these Levitical priests resigned out of office. Because they refused to carry out the duties of a high priest. So this is Matthew 27, right? Later on, Jesus goes on the cross. We've been told from Ephesians 2 and Colossians 2 that while he was on the cross, he abolished the law. So what happened is um, the timeline that you see at the bottom of page 14 there. So the first thing, the Levitical priests rejected and came out of office. The next thing, Jesus is on the cross, he abolishes the law. Then he dies. When he rose from the dead, remember that's where it was fulfilled. That's where God ordains him as high priest. Because the office is now vacant. These guys have resigned from office. So Jesus now enters into the office of the high priest the day he rose from the dead. And if you remember carefully, Mary Magdalene met him. And Mary wanted to touch him. And Jesus says, don't touch me. Because I have not yet gone to my, to my father and your father. Why was he going to his father? To go and present his blood as an offering for sins. So we see how the Levitical priest checked out of office. Jesus abolished the law. He be, entered the office of the high priest. Then he then goes to heaven to present and do the duties of a high priest. Without interfering with these guys because they are no longer there and their law has been gone. Now there is no law to, to, to disqualify him from being high priest. It's beautiful when you see how God laid these things out. Amen? So the law was abolished, guys. Otherwise, Jesus would not be our high priest. Now, before we go back to Hebrews, I want to show you something very interesting. We are now on page 15. It says the Levitical priesthood was replaced by Jesus and Christians. Why am I saying this? Remember, in Israel, there was one high priest. Then his brothers or his sons or his nephews and cousins, they were priests. Only of the lineage of Aaron could be priests. One of them was a high priest. Now today, Jesus has become the high priest. And that's what Hebrews is all about. Now remember, I mentioned that in the New Testament, the word priest appears 34 times in Hebrews, talking about Jesus' high priest office. Then it appears twice in Peter and three times in Revelations. And the, the time it appears in Peter and Revelations is now talking about you and me. That we have been made holy priests. So that's why I'm saying now Jesus has become the high priest and we believers have become priests. Now let's quickly look at a few verses on that one. First Peter chapter 2. No, let's start in Revelation. Revelation 1, 6. Revelation verse number, chapter number 1, verse number 6. Now to get this, I have to start reading in verse number 5. Uh, there's a part in the middle of verse number 5. It says, All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. That's Jesus, right? Verse number 6. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. This is the other time you, saw, you see the word priest. And the other two times again in Revelation, it's talking about you and me have been made priests. We have been made, in fact, he says kings and priests unto God. And this is interesting because in the old covenant, a person could not hold both the office of a king and a priest at the same time. If you doubt that, go and read the story of Uzziah in Chronicles. He tried to perform the duties of a priest while he was a king. And he was struck with leprosy. But for us, because we are believers, we have labored to enter into rest because of what Jesus has done, not what we do. We've been made kings and priests. Let's go to First Peter. First Peter chapter 2. This is the new priesthood now that there is, guys. Jesus is the high priest. You and me are priests. Verse number 5. The New Living Translation catches, catches it better than any other translation in this one. Verse number 5 says, in Second Peter chapter two, uh, in First Peter chapter two, sorry, it says, "And you are living stones that God is building into His spiritual temple. What's more, you are His holy priests. You are holy priests as believers. Through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifice that please God. Now, in the old covenant, they would offer grain or animal fat or animals or blood as an offering, but you and me." Our offering is not even money. It's the meditation of Jesus. When you sit down and you are thinking about Jesus, meditating about Jesus, to God it's like you are offering a pleasing sacrifice before God. Amen? 
Don't let people collect money from you and say, we, are, we want to offer something to the Lord. We are collecting an offering. The offering that is pleasing to God is your meditation of Jesus. Again, if you are collecting money, let's be clear. We are collecting to help a brother or a sister in Christ, or we are doing it for the propagation of the gospel. But not because we want to offer a pleasing gift to God. No. God is pleased with only one sacrifice, and that sacrifice is Jesus. And the way you offer it as a priest today is through your meditation of Jesus. These are not my words. I'm just reading the Bible to you. Eh? Let me continue reading. Verse number 6. As the scripture says, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for the great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Verse 7. Yes, you who trust him and recognize the honor God has given him, Sorry, you, yes, you, who trust and recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, he goes to the scriptures again, talking about Jesus. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. So they meet the fate that was planned for them. Verse number nine, but you are not like that. You, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests. A holy nation. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So the Levitical priesthood has been replaced by Jesus as the high priest and the believers as priests. Meaning you can wear that white collar thing and turn your collar upside down and walk in the streets. Because you are a priest. Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe what the Roman Catholic Church says or what God says in his word? You are a priest. You know, they've done the same thing with the word saint. I hear that after Mother Teresa died, they sat for days trying to decide whether she's a saint or she's not a saint. It's not up to them. It's up to whether she believed in Christ or not. If she's born again, she's a saint. If she's not born again, she's not a saint. Period. So you are a saint, you are a priest, you are a king, according to God. Anyway, the other stuff I'll let you read on your own. Let's quickly go and finish chapter 7 of Hebrews. We need to complete this one today. Hebrews chapter 7. Man, that was a, a, an expansion of uh, how the law changed. Verse number 20. Hebrews 7, verse number 20. It says, the new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendant became priest without such an oath. So after Aaron died or his descendants, people would just become priests, you know, just like they do it in the monarchy when a king dies, one of his sons or whoever gets, becomes a, a king. But for Jesus to become a priest, there was an oath spoken. It wasn't just automatic. Verse number 21, but there was an oath regarding Jesus. For God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break this vow. You are a priest forever. And again, this is Psalms 110, right? Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. So now he has talked about the priesthood changing. He has talked about the law changing. Now he is even touching the covenant. And to the Jews, hey, the covenant as well. Man, Hebrews butchers everything in the Old Testament. Now he's destroying the covenant. He is destroying of a new covenant that was brought in. Verse number 23. There were, there were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. He will never come out of office, right? Verse 25. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Now here we start something which is key, which you only find in Hebrews. It's true from the other epistles, but not as clear as it is in Hebrews. That Jesus' sacrifice was once, and it lasts forever. So he says Jesus is able to save people once, forever. Those who come to God through him. Why? Because he lives forever. He doesn't die. And he lives on to intercede for them. You have an intercessor. His name is Jesus. I know some people have started the intercessory ministries, but you don't find that in the New Covenant. Jesus is the intercessor. Amen? He's the one who prays on our behalf. If you read Romans 8, the Holy Spirit is the other intercessor. Now, it's not wrong to pray for the church or pray for pastors, but just know that we have a, a, a more powerful intercessor. As they, amen? Hallelujah. Verse 26. He is the kind of priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart 
from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. And he prays for you. Imagine. He has been given the highest pl place of honor in heaven and he is your intercessor. Why would you want to reject this and go back to that old system which is useless? Verse 27. Unlike those high priests, he does not need to offer his sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. He did it only once for all. You know, I first heard these teachings from Andrew and I thought, what? Because he was saying, Jesus obtained eternal redemption for us, we shall see it. He says, Jesus paid for our past, present, and even future ten sins. Hence, we are forgiven for our past, present, and even future ten sins. And I thought, mm, I think this is a bit too much. But it's in the Bible. How can you fight it when it's in the Bible? People make a big issue about sin. No. Make a big issue about how Jesus paid for the sin. We shall see in tomorrow's lessons. Yay. The way he took care of sin. But anyway, so he offered himself once. And he took care of the people, of the sins of the people, right? I'll read again. It says, they did this, this old priest who did it, uh, first for their sins and for the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. Verse 28, the law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath, and his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. So the law which was given during Moses' time in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, appointed people who would die. People who are sinners as priests. But years later, after Leviticus, we go into Deuteronomy, into, into Joshua, into Judges, then we're introduced into Samuel, then Samuel leads us to David. And David is the one who wrote Psalms 110. And we're saying years later, after the law was in effect, God spoke again. And he ordained his son through Psalms 110 to say you are a priest in the order of Melchizedek, right? So God then ordained his son way after the law was in effect. And because of that oath, God has made his son the perfect high priest forever. He's not going to come out of office, amen? And the good thing about this high priest, because he's in the order of Melchizedek, he can represent us Gentiles. So, to finish this lesson, Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 1 says, Here is the main point. So in case you didn't get anything from lesson number 1, from Hebrews 1, 1, this is what I've been trying to say all along. Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There he meets us in the heavenly tabernacle. The true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. Man, he touched the priesthood, he touched the Lord, he touched the covenant. Now he's touching the temple. To say that thing that you are worshipping, in, it's nothing. It's empty. God is not there. There is a true place of worship in heaven that was built by God and not by men, by human hands. And that is where our high priest is ministering. In the real temple, not that toy here on earth. I mean, he, he, he just destroys the old covenant, everything. And he's talking to Jews, eh? Verse number three. And since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices, our high priest must make an offering too. So now he's going to start also attacking the offerings. And that's what we'll see in our next lesson. Amen? So this is where we end today. Um, Please take some time to read some things in your notes, but otherwise I think I've covered it in the teaching. Hallelujah.